Uh, let us click wrap up our last lecture on energy. Uh, so here we're going to introduce the main concept of conservation of energy, which you've already essentially seen. We'll just formalize it a bit. Then we'll do some problems. So let's recap. Uh, the last lecture, I think, was a little abstract. Uh, so let's recap the main ideas here. In general, the main idea is always the work energy theorem. How does this kinetic energy of an object change by having forces do work on the object. What is work? You know, you might think of it as a force applied over a distance, but you also have to take into account the fact that the force might be pointing in a different direction. Like what we talked about with chapters three and four, forces or accelerations in the same direction of motion will speed up, anti-parallel will speed down, will speed, will reduce their speed, Perpendicular will only change direction, not changing the overall speed of the object. Work can be positive or negative. Positive if the object speeds up as a result of that force. Negative if the object slows down as a result of that force. And the formal true definition of work is the force vector dotted with the displacement vector. If the force is a force that is varying, you have to do an integral. If the force is a constant, you can just do, you can take it out of the integral and then it's just the force vector multiplied by, or taking the, the dot product with the displacement vector. That is always true, no matter what the force is. However, we saw for springs and gravity, they seem to obey some special relationships. In fact, in particularly we notice with the ball tossed into the air or rolled down a ramp or taken some weird roller coaster configuration. No matter what path it took to get from point A to point B, it always returned the same amount of energy that it possibly took away. These are examples of conservative forces. The energy can be stored away um, and gotten and returned for these forces. For these conservative forces, we can define potential energy. By the relationship that for that force, a change in potential energy is just minus the work done by that force. And again, what does that say? That says if I have an object, say that has some kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy goes down as a result of that force doing work, all that says is if the kinetic energy goes down, that means negative work was done by that force, but negative, negative that negative then means a positive change in potential energy. The energy got taken away from the object and stored away. So the potential energy went up. There is energy now in storage waiting to be used. Similarly, if kinetic energy increases, positive work was done by that force. So you could think of that as you're cashing in your savings of stored energy in that potential energy. Uh, the potential energy goes down in that case. When you only have conservative forces doing work, You know, they're going to be non-conservative forces in the problem, but if they're not doing any work, that's fine. The normal force is not particularly a conservative force. But in the case of objects moving across a surface, the normal force is always perpendicular to the direction of motion. In that case, it does no work. When you only have conservative forces doing work, then the work energy theorem says the change in kinetic energy is equal to the net work done. But then we could write that as, say, the, cha the negative change in potential energy of the system. I guess this would be also net if there are multiple. Maybe there's a spring and gravity that you're dealing with. If I move the delta U to the other side, this says the change in kinetic energy 
plus the change in potential energy must equal zero. Or the change in kinetic plus potential equals zero. Said another way, the change in the total energy, total mechanical energy really, equals zero. Where mechanical energy is usually associated with the conservative forces plus kinetic energy. <coughs> if there are other forces doing work, we don't consider that part of the mechanical energy of the system, which is the potentials plus uh, kinetic energy. And the conservation of mechanical energy is saying that if the total energy, the change in the total energy is zero, that's the same thing as saying that the total energy is a constant. Tell me the total energy at some time, that is the same total energy at any future or past time, no matter how widely separated those points in time are. It could be millennium. If there's no non-conservative forces, the energy does not change. So another way, the total energy, kinetic plus potential, at some point, some original point, is equal to the change, or sorry, is equal to kinetic plus potential at some later point. All this is saying is if I define this as my system, there is some kinetic energy and there is some potential energy and they might be converting from one to the other, but the overall quantity of energy within the system remains fixed. Just like how if you have cash that you continuously take out of your ATM and put take out of an ATM and put back into your savings account, but you never spend it on anything. You, know, you only just are taking it in and out of your bank account. The total amount of money you have does not change. And we saw that, for example, like for the ball tossed into the air, you know, my 0.1 kilogram ball launched with five joules. At every point along its path, the total energy, kinetic plus potential, was equal to five joules. Now, it wasn't always all kinetic energy. At the highest point, all that energy became potential energy, and the kinetic energy was zero, but that still added up to five joules. At some intermediate point where it's moving still, you know, halfway up its path, for example, there is both kinetic and potential energy. But we know it adds up to five joules in that case. I'm glad your book has since corrected this. It, it did not explain it like this when I had my earlier edition of this book as an undergrad. This is the simple idea of the conservation of mechanical energy, um, which assumes, uh, so this assumes no non-conservative forces. Right, you don't have friction or something acting on, on the system. And there's no external influences doing work. You know, I don't reach in and give the ball a smack, you know, as you know, as you know, I might be talking up in the air, and if someone else were to come and hit the ball. That would be an external influence doing work on the ball, which might change its overall energy. Or if there's no internal reactions that go on, you know, there, you know, you could imagine a little rocket attached to the um, to the ball, and suddenly, like when it's in, and suddenly when it's in the air, the rocket turns on. There would be that would be some internal, in a sense, an internal influence, but we would think of it as an external influence doing work on the original just ball system. But this is actually a specific example of a more general observed property of the universe. And I emphasize that in that 
we have no proof of what I'm going to call the conservation of energy. But experiment has yet to prove otherwise. So this is an example of the general, I mean, I'm gonna give it a color. Conservation of energy principle. Which states, conservation of energy states Energy is always conserved. As long as you do proper accounting. As long as you take into account whether or not things are adding energy into the system, maybe by doing work on the system, you know, a push, a smack, you know, on the ball as the ball, as I'm tossing the ball up in the air. As long as you take into account non-conservative forces that are turning energy into other forms of energy, like friction, you know, that what it, this is saying, and then of course there's an, the exchange of potentials and kinetic. All this is saying is as long as you take an accounting of where all the energy is going, it's perfectly conserved. You know, the ex an example, you know, is if I take my hands, I rub them together. There is kinetic energy that I am, that are, that is in my hands. But because of the friction between my hands, some of that kinetic energy gets lost. Said more properly, that kinetic energy gets transformed into a different kind of energy. In this case, we would call it thermal energy. I feel my hands heating up. Some of that kinetic energy is being given to the air molecules around the room, particularly the ones near my hand, some of that energy then goes into increasing the kinetic energy of the air around my hands and the random motion of, say, the molecules that make up my skin. And I perceive that as it feel, the region feels hotter. So while kinetic energy has been lost from my hands that I cannot get back, that energy has turned into another kind of energy, in the case, thermal energy energy of random motions. We'll talk a little bit about this when we do thermo at the end of the semester. And that energy was not completely destroyed, never to be seen again, but it was just turned into something else. And the profound point here, again, thinking that you can define your system to be whatever you want. You know, my system was my hands, it was the ball, maybe it's the earth. Just keep zooming out. Why not just make your system the entire closed universe? Which I guess is a hypothetical, we don't know. But presumably uh, our universe exists kind of isolated from the rest of maybe all other universes in the multiverse, if such a thing is true. That means for this isolated system of, in our universe, there is a fixed total amount of energy that makes up our entire universe. And everything we do, anything that we do that requires motion with kinetic motion, you know, the heat that is generated when I rub my hands together, the metabolic uh, energy that is transformed when I say eat something and it gets converted into energy that I can then use to move around and do meaningful work. That is all part of some finite, fixed, constant reservoir of energy that makes up the universe. We are just tapping into this finite bank, uh, the, universe, the universe's bank of energy. 
and we're using some of that total energy to do things like exist, play soccer, um, you know, that sort of thing. What is the total energy of the universe? Great question. I don't know. Some say it's zero, but that's a subtle point. Uh, you can ask me about my, um, you can take my physics 90 class or you can ask me about it. So what the conservation of energy is saying is suppose you have some system which might have kinetic energy. There might be forces that can do conservative work uh, with potential energy and they can exchange things with one another. But there might be non-conservative forces that take energy out of the system. But again, we can think of it not as that energy is being destroyed, just you have your system here and I'm taking stuff out of the system and putting it elsewhere. Maybe I'm putting it over here as thermal energy of heat, you know, from friction. Or maybe I'm putting it over here in terms of the random motions of the air molecules. You know, that energy still exists, but now it's just over here, not part of my system that is over here. Energy can also be injected in by external work that could add energy to the system. You know, again, the, the person that slaps the ball while I'm just sitting here tossing it up into the air, you know, with keeping its energy fixed. You know, if someone smacks the ball, that smack does work on the ball and changes the total energy of the system. That was an external influence. But again, what's happening there is that the slap of the hand is turning the kinetic energy of the hand. It, the hand does work on the ball and in essence is giving some of that kinetic energy the hand had to the ball. So that energy was not created, but rather transferred from the hand into the system. Which, as long as we take into all, all that accounting into place, energy seems to be neither created nor destroyed. As long as you take proper accounting of all its forms. There's my conceptually profound statement for, for the day. Now we can try to do some problems. We saw, for example, that when I was tossing the ball up into the air, um, no matter what path it took to get back down, it returned back down to my hand with the same energy it started with, which as a result meant it returned back to my hand with the same kinetic energy that it started with. I could imagine just half the problem a case where I just drop the ball vertically from rest, a case where I, the ball rolls down a ramp from rest, or takes some weird roller coaster path from rest. In that case, in all of those cases, the kinetic energy it has when it reaches the bottom is the same. We can do this by thinking of this in terms of the conservation of energy. So suppose I have a couple ramps. They all start at some height h. Ramp A gets going and then immediately drops down to the bottom. There's A. Ramp B just goes down at a constant rate. Ramp C hangs out a while, then goes down, but then kind of levels off again. where ramp D takes its sweet time and then drops down to the end. And in all of these cases, I release a ball from the same height from rest. And I ask, what is the speed of each of these when it reaches the bottom of the ramp? So in this case, I would think what forces are acting on the ball? There is gravity, which is conservative, great. And there's the contact force with the ramp which is always perpendicular to the motion. 
so it does no work. And let's assume no friction. So since only gravity is doing work on the object, I can use conservation of mechanical energy, really. So with conservation problems, what you really want to do is you want to identify what do you know at the start and at the end in terms of the energy of the system. If you can say something about the total energy at both the start and the end, since energy is conserved, you can relate the two with an equal sign. So at the start, I would say the kinetic energy was zero. It started from rest. At the end, it's some one half m v final squared. Or I don't know, I would like to figure out what v final is. Really, it's I'm only able to really say anything about the speed. So I should make that explicit. You can never get a vector out of this. Uh, you only can say something about the, the scalar speed. Now, what potential is there for gravity to do something at the start and at the end? And just as a little aside, remember, we wrote that we could write mgy as perhaps as the value for the potential energy at some point, where in this case, it's taking the convention that the floor is y equals zero. You can actually set it this to be whatever you want. You can add some arbitrary constant you know, it could, you could add 0, you could add 20, you could add negative 6. Uh, it doesn't matter, because it's only the changes in potential energy that really matter. So any constant will just cancel out. So your book takes the convention that the uh, horizontal axis, or where y equals 0, is the convention they take to where uh, the potential energy also equals 0. And let's do that as well. So in this case, I would say the final potential energy is 0. In all of these cases, the ball ends up on the ground. And in this case, they all originally start with some, with the same gravitational potential energy. They're all starting at the same height. So they all start with the same gravitational potential energy. Then I could say the total energy at the, at, at the start is just mgh. The total energy at the end looks like it's just one half m v squared. Maybe that's start and end. Conservation of energy says t star equals t end. Or m g h equals one half m v squared. I didn't really say anything about the about the marbles, but they could have actually been different different masses as well, because notice that the mass the, whatever the mass is, it cancels anyway. And notice that in all of these cases I can say the velocity or the speed rather is the square root of two g h. I had to know nothing about what went on between the starting point and the end point. I could only look at what happened, where we started, and where we ended up. By conservation of energy, I can relate those two things just by taking into account all the work that was done along the way. In this case, only gravity was doing work. We could have done this using the work energy theorem. This is essentially what we did. Uh, we just wrote it in a different way and called it the conservation of energy. If you don't believe me, I have a demo, oh, a recorded demo. <laughs> so we have one of these fancy contraptions that have the same exact um, setup as the examples I showed. You know, the ramps are exactly these four ramps. Yeah, let me get started and I will, let's make it bigger. So here there are four ramps side by side. They're kind of hard to see, which is why I drew them here. 
you know, from way in the back is ramp A, then as you go towards the camera, it's A, B, C, and D. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a ruler to station, to station up uh, four uh, ball bearings that I'm going to then release simultaneously. So they're all going to start from rest at the very top at the same height. And then if we let them go, hmm, they clearly got to the bottom at different times. Here's the same thing in slow motion. Okay, is that concerning or not? I claim it's not. Because what the conservation of energy is telling us is it's only saying what the speed of the ball is when it gets to the bottom. It's saying nothing about how long it takes to get to the bottom. Here's the same thing again, but kind of an overhead view. Again, just to show that the marbles get to the bottom at different times. The ordering appears to be that A, B, C, D is the order at which it takes, you know, A gets down there before B, before C, before D. And maybe that's not too surprising. Remember, A was the case where it was an immediate drop off. Whereas you went to B, C, and D, it was more gradual, particularly at first, until it got to um, the bottom. Either uniform or weighted to the very end. But again, what we can now look at uh, is I can do the same thing, but then we can look at the motion of the balls once they all leave the ramp. And here's an example in real time. Oops. But then I do it again in slow motion. And if they were all moving at the same speed, then you should notice that once the balls are moving across the frictionless floor, that their spacing should not change. They should remain roughly the same distance from each other as they move forward. And that it's indeed the case when you watch them move across the floor. As they move across the floor, the balls are not getting closer to one another and they're not getting farther apart from one another. They are moving, in this case, at the same speed once they get to the bottom. Now, as we saw, they got to the bottom at different rates. You know, A got, got down there first, for example. But once they leave the incline, you're just going from the starting point to the end point. They leave the ramp, no matter what the ramp looked like, with the same speed. Which I think is pretty cool. Which is again just the idea behind conservation of energy. This would have been a very challenging problem to do with Newton's laws. We would have had to take the exact shape of the ramp into account and calculated how much of the component of the gravity vector, the force due to gravity, pointed in the direction of motion each time. For By each time, I mean for every infinitesimally small little instant in time. And then trace out, you know, over billions and billions of those little increments, uh, how much kinetic energy is uh, gained as a result. Conservation of energy, by using that result, we could skip all that nonsense. And just look at the starting point and the end point. And really, this comes as a result of being able to look at um, potential energy and think about potential energy. Consider this setup. A good old projectile problem. There's a cannon on a hill. It launches a cannonball into the air at some angle. It rises up, eventually comes back down, crashes onto the ground. Maybe I want to ask, what speed 
Does this hit the ground? Now to do this with Newton's laws, we would need to know the angle of launch, the initial velocity, which I will have to give us here as well. So let's assume that it's launched with some initial velocity v, v naught rather. Uh, the cannonball though, it won't actually matter. We'll say it has some mass m. Now to do this with Newton's laws again, I would have to look at what's going on in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction. I would have to use the kinematics equations. I would then have to figure out how long it takes for the projectiles to reach the ground. You know, I would have to solve for some time t. I would then have to plug that t into the kinematics equations to get a horizontal and a vertical velocity. Then I would have to take the magnitude of those two to get the overall speed. Since it's only gravity acting on the object once it's in the air, gravity being conservative means that there's only conservative forces I can apply conservation of energy. So my start, I might say the kinetic energy of start was one half the mass of the ball, the initial speed of the ball squared. Don't need to know the angle because I'm not dealing with vectors. I'm just dealing with the overall magnitude, the speed. And then at the end, the kinetic energy is one half m v final, oops, v final squared, or has the square of some final speed. I guess I had it right before, sorry. Where this is actually what we are trying to figure out. Now gravity is working, so there's potential. There's potential for gravity to do something. Initially, the cannon ball starts a height h above the ground. In this case, it actually rises up for a bit and then comes back down. But nonetheless, I don't care about what happens in the intermediate. I know that it started at a height h above the ground. At its starting point, there was a potential for gravity to do mgh worth of work. And then the potential for gravity to do anything once it's reached the ground is zero. And again, conservation of energy. What can I say? I can say that the initial total energy, one half m v naught squared plus m G H equals the total final, uh, the final total energy, which is just one half m v final squared, and there's no potential. Notice the masses cancel, as you might have expected. We actually showed that for projectiles before. If energy did not also do that, that would be weird. And then we get solved for the final velocity squared. It looks like it's gonna be something like the initial velocity speed squared rather times two g h. Or that the final speed is the square root of the initial speed plus two g h. And we're done. One line of math, uh, no Newton's laws, no components. When you can connect the starting point and the end point through conservation, life just gets so much simpler. Who cares what happened in, you know, in between? Notice also this is saying that um, it didn't even matter what angle you la launched the cannonball. You could have launched it up, you could have launched it horizontally, you could have originally started launching it directly down you would have ended up with the same answer either way. How much room do I have here? Uh, da, da, da.
And again, all of this really is saying is conservation of energy is saying that there is an exchange between kinetic energy and any potentials that are in the system. You know, gravity, springs, elect electrostatic. So sometimes it's worth thinking about, um, sometimes it's worth thinking about this visually in what's called a potential energy diagram. What you do for a potential energy diagram is you just plot the function that corresponds to the potential energy. So if this is the potential energy, and let's do gravity, since that's a simpler example. And on the horizontal axis, I'm plotting the height off the ground. And I'm plotting what is the potential energy at some height off the ground. It's going to look something like this. It's going to be MGY, whatever it is. It's a linear line. This potential energy diagram is actually telling us something about what is and is not possible for a given object. You know, let's take the 1.1 kilogram ball. I initially launched it from my hand with five joules of kinetic energy, and we showed in the previous lecture that that meant the ball was able to rise five meters into the sky. Because at five meters into the sky, gravity had done enough work to drain away all of that kinetic energy. In the ideas of the conservation of energy, all of that kinetic energy got stored away as potential gravitational energy. So what we again did was we tossed it at the from the ground, not at the ground, um, with five joules of kinetic energy. In this case, the total energy of the system at the beginning, right when I let, let the ball left my hand, you know, is five joules of kinetic energy plus zero joules of potential, if I call zero, the zero point when we're at the ground, the total energy was five joules of energy. At the top, when the ball momentarily stopped before it started to fall back down to the ground, the kinetic energy at the top became zero and the gravitational potential energy then had become five joules. And we showed that you know, if the potential energy in this case, since it's mgy, we could then solve, you know, if g is 10 and m is 0.1, those multiplied together is essentially one, why the maximum height it reached at that highest point was about five meters. You know, if you would have claimed, you might say, why not six meters? You know, it's five meters, but it would have been nonsense for me to say that it could be six meters in the air because mg times six meters was, it would have been about six joules of energy, which is greater than the total energy I initially gave to the ball. The ball only had five joules of energy to deal, to work with. You can't suddenly have six joules of potential energy because where did that six come from? You know, five, it got five of those joules from taking away the kinetic energy of the ball. But then that additional joule seems to have just been made out of thin air. So in terms of potential energy diagrams, so I guess here the takeaways it goes because the total energy at the start equaled five joules. Energy can be, be either kinetic or potential, and maybe it's a little bit of both. You know, halfway up the journey, the ball is both moving and above the ground. So it has both potential and kinetic energy. But their sum still adds up to five joules. Right, so a way to look at potential energy diagrams is you might draw a horizontal line that corresponds to the total energy you have. 
In this case, maybe it's five joules. If you know the total energy of the system, you know that at best, the object can come to rest, have no kinetic energy, and have all of that energy stored as potential. You know, at best, the potential energy can be at most equal to the total energy, not more. That would be the case where, say, the ball is momentarily at rest at the top before it then starts to fall back down. So in this case, I would say these regions here, or specifically if I go down to the values for y, these values for y are the only possibilities for this particular ball to exist at. I can find the ball anywhere between 0 and 5 meters. I can never find it up at 6 meters because I just don't have enough energy to give uh, to gravity. You know, I only gave it 5 joules of energy, kinetic energy. Gravity takes those 5 joules away. That's when the ball reaches its maximum point. That occurs at 5 meters. It cannot go beyond 5 meters because that would mean even more energy is put into gravitational potential, which would violate conservation. And we don't want to do that. So these potential energy diagrams can give you a sense of where you can and cannot go. In this case, the ball could be anywhere between the ground and 5 meters. This is more particularly interesting when you say, look at like nuclear physics. When you're inside the nucleus of an atom, there is some potential energy associated with the nuclear forces that are holding, say, the electron to the nucleus. Um, sorry, I'm saying when you're inside the atom, right? Electrons orbit the nucleus. Um, and they are held together by some sort of electro, uh, um, electric force. The potential energy of what's going on in the system might look something like this, where it kind of goes down, then it dips back up, and then it has this uh, inverse square law effect uh, farther out. If I have an electron, so I guess this is, what's the x-axis? You can say like distance, from nucleus. If I have an electron that, say, has this much total energy, so this might be the total energy of my electron, that means the electron can only exist at these possible distances, or if I project it down onto the horizontal axis, these are the only distances that this electron can exist at. Because if it tries to go farther away, notice it has to then go beyond and have a value for the potential energy that exceeds the total energy the electron has. This point right here, we might call a turning point. Because if the electron tries to go beyond that point to larger distances, it then would have a potential energy that exceeds the total energy the electron has. That can't be true. Because that means that's the point where the speed of the electron is identically zero. All of its energy is in potential. So to go beyond that would require even more energy that does not exist. So that location might be where the electron turns around. Similarly here, this would be also an example of a turning point where the electron turns around. And so the electron could be anywhere kind of in between these two distances, just kind of flat, you know. So this would be an example of a bound electron. The electron stays locked to the atom. Versus if you have something like this, but then I say the electron in this case has this much total energy. In this case, the electron K 
cannot get arbitrarily close to the nucleus. You know, once it reaches this point, it reaches a turning point. Because to get closer would mean that its potential energy is too great and exceeds the total energy. But it can be at all of these distances, and in particular it can go anywhere beyond uh, the, that distance there. So in this case I might say these are all the potential possibilities that the electron can exist at, which includes just going arbitrarily farther away and away and away. This might be an example of an unbound electron. Or I would say this is an atom that is about to be ionized. So, and this would be a case of a bound electron. Which again, you can just, by just looking at the potential energy of the system, if I know the total energy and the potential energy, I can say something about whether or not the electron can go anywhere, for example. Do I want to do this optional thing? Hmm, I'm running short on time. Really briefly, we derived potential energies using forces. We evaluated the work that a force did and turned that into a potential energy. You could ask if you could go the other way. If I told you, here's a potential energy function, could you from that determine the force? You know, before we did an integral over the force, maybe for, for gravity or a spring. If I just told you the potential energy is this function, could you, back, could you essentially do the problem backwards and get back out a vector force? And you can. Let me just do it quickly for 1D. For 1D, we said that the work a force does is the force over some distance. You know, which might be positive or negative, depending on the system. That is the work the force did on the system. But if it's a conservative force, we also said that the work was negative the change in potential energy. So in this case, we could write down that the change of potential energy is negative F times the displacement. Again, this is in 1D. Or I could say that delta U over delta X equals, I guess I could say negative delta U over delta X equals F, the force that we so desire. And you can imagine if we did this a little bit more carefully, we could do this in the language of calculus. The general answer is that give me a potential energy function. I'll take its derivative. I'll throw in a minus sign for good measure. And that is indeed the force, um, if I wanted to get the magnitude of the force. Also, actually, it gives you, if you're careful about your coordinate system, it actually does give you the vector as well. You know, for example, the gravitational potential energy was mgy. The gravitational force is then negative ug over uy, which is then just negative mg you get the force back out. Um, in a sense, the potential energy and the forces are connect, they are indeed connected to one another in this sense. That's kind of an aside. All right, some questions. Uh, let's see, number two in the book. Uh, so problem 8.2 in the book. Uh, you have a frictionless roller coaster that looks like this. Um, and it gives you some values. So let me recopy this. So you have a roller coaster that has one hump, two humps, and it goes to a hump at half the height. And then maybe it goes off into a larger, a larger hump. Your roller coaster is initially moving with some initial speed. 
uh, V-naught just as it goes over the first hump. Then it goes down, it goes back up over the second hump, then it goes over a smaller hump, and then it sails up a larger, larger ramp. It says that the initial velocity, or the initial speed rather, is 17 meters per second. The mass of the uh, coaster car is 825 kilograms. Uh, and this height H is 42 meters. And then I'm going to solve slightly different problems here. You know, at these points A, B, and C, I could ask, how fast is the roller coaster car moving? What is its speed? Again, what forces are at play if this is a frictionless roller coaster? Uh, there is gravity, which is a conservative force and does work. There is also the contact force with the roller coaster, but it is always perpendicular to the direction of motion and does not work. I can therefore use conservation of energy. So I write down my total energy at the start and stop. At the start, the kinetic energy was 1 half m v naught squared. And the potential energy due to gravity, if I call the ground zero, is again just mg, and looks like in this case, capital H. If I'm asking what is the end point, now I have to pick you know, which of these points do I want to investigate. Maybe I'll do A first. So then at point A, the kinetic energy is 1 half mv final squared final at A. And then the potential energy is again just mg capital H because it returns back to its original height. The conservation of energy says I can set these equal to one another. One half mv naught squared plus mg H equals one half mv final squared at A plus mg capital H. Both sides have an mgh. Um, in that case, then both sides have a 1 half m. So you find that the speed is exactly the same. It returned back to its original height. Its speed, regardless of what it did in between, will be the same. So it will be moving at 17 meters per second. What about at B? At B, the kinetic energy might be 1 half m v final squared at B, whatever that is, that's what we're trying to find. But then the potential energy is not mgh, but it's mgh over 2. That second hill is only half as tall. Conservation of energy says, I can take my starting point, which I will keep as that first hill. I could have went and used A, point A, as my starting point if I wanted to. Doesn't matter. You'll get the same answer. But in this case, I'll use that same starting point uh, here. Uh, and use that in my conservation of energy equation. So then at that starting point, that is the total energy, kinetic plus potential. Then at the end point, it's 1 half m v final squared at b plus m g, in this case now, h over 2. Now since it's h and h over 2, I can't just blindly cancel out the entire term. So I now have to solve uh, for what's going on here. And I'll leave it to you to figure that out. So I get that the final speed is the initial speed plus gh. Or a little math magic. 
the final speed not squared is the square root of that which I get as not uh, not 17 meters per second but as 26.47 meters per second so it speeds up uh, it has a faster speed uh, when it's at B what if you end at C then the kinetic energy is one half mv final squared at C the potential energy in that case is zero so then I claim by the same th same way um, this is something like 33.35 meters per second for the final speed again just by using conservation of energy I could use that point that start point that I highlighted in red that's my starting point and then my ending point is point C I could have used as my starting point point B maybe that's where I say my starting point is and my end point is at C you'll get the same answer I could have used some random intermediate point um, as long as I'm careful with my conservation and look at what is the total energy in terms of how it's potential plus uh, kinetic I will get the same answer then I could ask how high does it make does it go up the final hill so going back to the drawing maybe then it reaches some maximum height here E where this is you know, maybe it's little h and I'm trying to find what is the value for little h and this is how high does it go so it makes the highest possible um, location it can make it my starting point is the same you know all the you know, kinetic and potential I can use those initial that initial point for the end point here here I'm saying it's as high as I can go so that might be that turnaround point right as he's about to and then the cart would start moving backwards and then this is mg but now little h so now since it's kind of far off the screen plus mg big h that was my starting energy and that is my final total energy no kinetic only potential so then I get this is 56.74 meters. Again, I needed to know nothing, nothing about what was happening in, in between these points. I didn't even need to know anything about A, B, and C to find E. I could use right where I started, you know, several hills ago, and I could connect what's going on there in terms of energy to what's going on at point E. Oof. Mm, I have two more problems. I can probably get through one within my allotted time. So the second problem might go a little bit over. This is a good, um, a good problem. You might have seen this if you've ever draw if you've ever driven. In locations where there are steep hills sometimes there are emergency um, emergency escape ramps for trucks you know a truck is going down a hill maybe its brakes fail maybe the road is slippery the truck feels like it's losing control of the car or the truck rather um, there might you might have noticed that there are kind of off ramps where the truck can kind of steer off the road and just rise up some usually gritty incline where the point of those is that gravity and friction are trying to drain away the kinetic energy of the truck as quickly as possible so let's suppose we have some ramp so this is problem 15 Suppose there's some off ramp where it makes a 15 degree angle with the horizontal. 
a truck is careening down a hill, feels like it's losing control, and so it steers into this off-ramp. It enters this emergency off-ramp at moving at 130 kilometers per hour, which is 36.11 meters per second. Oof. The mass is 1.2 times 10 to the 4 kilograms. Let's see, theta was 15 degrees, I already said that. And so when I mean that it's entering the ramp, I mean when the, um, let me use a red arrow here. I mean when it is right here, oops, auto advance fail. Um, when the, you know, this is the starting point you know, based on what it's saying here. And then we want to ultimately end up here uh, where the truck has come to a stop. Funny enough, I placed my starting go point in red and my stopping point in green. Suppose if we start here and we end here, the hypotenuse of this ramp has some length L, some height Y. I might ask A, without friction, how long L should the ramp be? to just barely be able to bring the truck to rest, um, at which point hopefully it can get control of its brakes and safely exit. So a relationship we'll need here based on this triangle I just drew is that Y in this case is L uh, sine theta. We'll need that in a second because it's L that I ultimately want, but it's Y that appears in potential energy. So my starting point, poorly chosen as the red dot. Again, I could think what's going on here. There's gravity, there's a contact force. The contact force does no work, gravity does. I can use conservation of energy again, I'm to treat. So the original kinetic energy of the truck is one half the mass of the truck, the initial speed of the truck squared. We know all this information. I gave you the mass, I gave you the initial speed when it entered the ramp. The gravitational potential energy in this case, I might call zero. I might call where the ramp starts. I'll call that the ground. And then it, as it goes up the ramp, um, the potential energy will be increasing. Then what's going on at the end? It's being brought to rest. So I could say that the kinetic energy at this uh, end point is zero. The potential energy is the mass of the truck, G, times the height it has risen off the ground. Which again, this is why I wrote down that expression before. We'll also write as MGL sine theta because we ultimately want to figure out what L is. And again, remember why did the gravity, gravitational potential only depend on the vertical height? Remember that was the case where gravity can do work um, and maybe the, your motion is at an angle relative to gravity, which always points straight down. Um, but we saw, I think last lecture that because of the dot product, you get out only the component of gravity along the direction of motion. And the geometry worked out to, it was equivalent to just looking at the vertical displacement. So by the conservation of energy, I can say that one half m, the initial speed squared, plus zero, equals the final total energy, which is zero kinetic energy plus mg, I guess, sine theta times l. I know, I know everything except L, so I can solve for L. 
So L I get as 257 point, looks like 04 meters. I can't read my own writing. That is what's needed for a 15 degree ramp to bring the truck to a stop. B, suppose you have a kinetic friction as well. So the off ramp is rough with a kinetic friction of coefficient of 0.3. I could ask now, what is L? Now we have to be more careful. There's this friction guy, which is not a conservative force. I cannot blindly apply the conservation of energy because there's now this, we can think of it as an external force draining energy from the system. Energy cannot just exchange itself between kinetic and potential, but now there's this friction that is also siphoning away some of that energy um, that prevents it from being retained in your kind of savings bank. In this case, for this particular example, it will be more helpful because it makes the truck stop sooner, but it does so by robbing the system of energy. So here I can always start with the work energy theorem. The change in kinetic energy equals the net work that is being done on the system. In this case, gravity is doing work and friction is doing work. Gravity was a conservative force, so I could always write that as the negative change in potential energy due to gravity. But then friction is not conservative, I just gotta keep that as work. That's the same thing as saying the change in kinetic plus the change in potential equals the work done by friction. Or that the change in the total energy, kinetic plus potential, equals the work being done by friction. Before it was equal to zero, which allowed us to say energy was conserved, the total energy was always the same. Now we're saying the total energy, kinetic plus potential, is actually changing and it's changing equal to the amount of work that friction ultimately does. We nonetheless can still use the ideas of um, looking at two points widely separated in time. I'll copy and paste them real quick. Uh, you know, we still can use these of course, L is now different. L is not the same as it was before. But now there's also, you know, I might call it external or non-conservative work being done. So there's the work being done by friction, which is the force due to kinetic friction dotted with the displacement. You know, here we kind of have to go back to a free body diagram. I have this box represent the truck. Right, there's some there's gravity, there's the contact force, the velocity is this way, friction is pointing against the displacement. Since it's going up the ramp, but friction points down the ramp, I should expect this work to be negative, of course. So in this case, the force due to friction is negative. I'm going to throw the negative in. The dot product, you know, would be cosine of 180 degrees. That's where the negative comes from. The coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal component or the surface force from the ramp, which is not mg, but is mg cosine theta in this case. You can do that, you know, convince yourself of that by Newton's laws multiplied by the displacement, which in this case is just L. It moves a distance L before going to stop. So the change in kinetic plus potential, that is kinetic plus potential final minus kinetic plus potential initial, that is equal to the final 
is zero kinetic energy, mgl sine theta for the gravitational potential, minus the initial. Initially, one half mv naught squared plus zero gravitational potential. We also said that the change in kinetic plus potential was equal to the work being done by friction, which I just claimed was negative mu k m g cosine theta times L. What can we do? We can set this equal to this. We know everything. I know g, I know m, I know sine, I know the initial speed, I know cosine, I know mu. We know everything except for L. So then you can get L in this case is now just 121.27 meters. It decreased, as is expected. Actually, I can write down what the expression was. Uh, that can be useful as well. So I get that in this case, L is V naught over two, and then it looks like it's mu uh, G cosine of theta plus g sine of theta. And I think I wrote it down above, correct? Did I not? I guess I did not. Well, this defeats the point I was trying to make. Back up here, we could have, you know, derived an equation and it would have looked something like this uh, for the non-friction case. And the point I was going to make, uh, but now is kind of lost, is that it's always good to get in the habit to make sure that your answers make sense. In the case of where there's friction, that is, that looks like a much more complicated equation than what I highlighted above when there was no friction. But if I tuned down friction in the bottom equation so that friction went to zero or friction vanished, I should get back exactly what we had derived before, which notice we do. If I set mu k, mu sub k equal to zero, the denominator just becomes 2g sine theta, just like what it was above, where the length of the ramp, um, I would say, collapses back to what it was originally. And again, we got all of this by applying conservation of energy, or you know, for this, for this very last example when there was friction, really here I was applying the true conservation of energy. That energy is not created or destroyed, but just passed around as long as you account for where it's going. In this very last example, it was not just kinetic potential, but also some of it got drained away and tossed into you know friction, maybe it was you know, the ground might have heated up. Um, there might have been some motion given to the dust um, that was kicked up because of this. You know, that energy must be accounted for. Um, it takes energy to do that. And that energy came from the system of the truck moving up the ramp. All right, I actually think I'm going to leave it there. Um, I was going to do um, number 27, which is a, a Tarzan problem. Uh, just because that one's good because you have to both use conservation of energy and then you have to plug that into Newton's laws to figure out the tension in the string. And it also was a good reason to review circular motion. Uh, but since we're doing the conical pendulum in lab, maybe that's okay. All right, very good. Huzzah for energy.